Well, the crisis in Syria has reached a very critical point. Uh, the uprising is dispersed throughout the country in many rural and suburban areas and some of the smaller cities. Uh, it is nine months old. The uprising is very persistent, very powerful. It is not in, in, uh, throughout the entire country, but it is very uh, widely distributed. Uh, it uh, has produced uh, a Syrian National Council, which is largely from outside Syria. There's also a coordination committee inside Syria. Uh, most of the uprising is peaceful, but some groups uh, are becoming armed. Uh, and there's also the emergence of uh, what they call themselves the Free Syrian Army, which is former army officers also uh, using arms in the rebellion. Uh, so, uh, the, on the other hand, the regime uh, has withstood this onslaught, let's say, this uprising, uh, has uh, stood uh, f firm, uh, has been, uh, 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 been very tough and very brutal in the way it has dealt uh, with the uprising. Uh, but unlike some other regimes in Egypt and Tunisia and Yemen, has not had uh, major defections or major, major cracks yet. Uh, in the regime. So it's a very strong and tough uprising and a very tough and strong regime at the same time. Uh, so in a sense there's a bit of a balance of power there. But one would have to say uh, time is moving against the regime uh, because with the passage of time the economy which is already in very desperate uh, straits is, is under even further pressure. And also uh, Syria's uh, environment uh, regionally and internationally has become increasingly hostile. Uh, Syria had many more friends before this started. It's lost most of them. Uh, so the regime, uh, although still tough and, and, uh, and fighting hard, and still has friends in Iran uh, and in Iraq and in Hezbollah and Lebanon, uh, it seems to be on a downward gradient. I would describe the current situation not as a civil war, but as uh, uh, fighting between a regime and uh, many parts of its own population. Even the peaceful protesters have been met with violence. Uh, uh, of course, there's some elements of the uprising which are becoming armed. Those, too, are being met with violence. So it's uh, a fight between a government and its own people cannot exactly be described as a civil war, uh, but it is uh, increasingly uh, one in, in which arms are being used uh, now, is there a risk uh, for Syria to uh, descend into civil war, by which we mean if the regime collapses, there are those who fear that Syria, Syria will sort of divide into rival communities, perhaps on a sectarian basis, like happened in Iraq, like happened in Lebanon, that we would have a civil war. I think there is some risk of that. Uh, the regime itself, in a way, is exaggerating that risk or even uh, moving uh, to escalate such a risk because they always pose as the alternative to a civil war. Uh, so I think it's, it's somewhat exaggerated, but there is a risk there. Um, if the state completely collapses in Syria, as it did in a sense in Iraq and in Lebanon previously, uh, there might be a brief period of, uh, of sort of civil war and, and uh, sectarian and even other forms of violence. But unlike Iraq and Lebanon, there isn't a, a balance of power among communities in Syria to have a drawn-out civil war. Uh, if it comes to that, the Arab-Sunni majority in Syria is so overwhelming, it's 70 percent, it's in all the big cities, uh, that Syria, in a sense, cannot have a civil war. Uh, at the end of the day, there is a clear majority, and if it comes to that, that voice will be dominant. Uh, so I do think there's a risk of, of a very violent transition and a very difficult transitional period, but I don't think a descent into long-term civil war is, is, uh, is possible in Syria. A dynamic that is uh, certainly will have a very long-term uh, impact is the economy of Syria. Uh, the bargain previously from the regime had been that we will provide stability and, se and security, we will not provide democracy, but we will also provide prosperity and growth. Uh, now this is breaking down because the Syrian economy is in very dire straits. The Syrian economy was not doing terribly well before the uprising started and certainly has begun to tank since the uprising began. Uh, tourism, which was a very large sector, has completely stopped, obviously. Foreign direct investment, which was picking up quite healthily, is down to 
single digits in proportion to what it was. Trade is down 60, 70 percent. Uh, and the prospects of, of any economic pickup are, are very dim because this crisis looks to be long term. Uh, uh, so many of people from the middle class and the business class in Syria, particularly in the big cities and towns which had benefited from some economic growth in recent years, are now in a very tight bind. They're not very enthusiastic about a complete uprising which they fear might bring a period of chaos and further economic loss. But the old bargain is not working anymore because there is no economic prosperity. Uh, the economy is not fully isolated. Of course, there are sanctions from the West and so on. Uh, and there's a drop in all of these sectors. But it is still a rather open economy regionally, open certainly to trade with Iran and investments. Same with Iraq. Trade with Turkey is still ongoing. Trade with Lebanon and Jordan and the Gulf countries is all ongoing. Uh, but, the, but the economy is in very difficult circumstances. Uh, this will not have an immediate impact. The economy is not going to collapse tomorrow. Uh, but if one looks several months down the road, it is a very, very heavy burden for the economy, for the population, and for the government to carry. I think the U.S. and the EU role has been so far uh, calibrated and, and correct. I think they were all slow to get off the mark. Uh, initially, in the first few months of the uprising in Syria, many countries were reluctant to speak out against the regime uh, because they feared chaos or they feared the alternative and so on. But I think by the month of August, which also happened to be the month of Ramadan uh, in the region, uh, the West uh, uh, caught up, I think, with the, with the correct position, which is to support immediate, cha first of all, immediate cessation of the brutal uh, crackdown, immediate implementation of reforms, immediate everything, and or uh, uh, the regime or the president stepping aside if those are not delivered immediately. Uh, that was and remains the correct position at the time, uh, but more needs to be done moving forward. Uh, uh, if the regime continues its brutal crackdown without, uh, uh, without dramatic change, uh, the issue of sanctions might be revisited to explore more, uh, more of those. Uh, and working with the Arab League and with uh, countries in the region and with the Syrian opposition both outside and inside Syria, examine measures that could further protect civilians in Syria from the crackdown of the regime and help uh, encourage or force uh, positive political change in Syria. Well, the Arab League uh, has been very active, as it was in the Libyan uh, crisis. It is also being very active in the Syrian crisis. Uh, the Arab League, which had been dormant, in a sense, for decades, is suddenly, again, a very active player. That's partly the result of the change in Egypt itself. Egypt now is a very legitimate symbol in the Arab world. Uh, it's also a result of the activism of uh, Gulf states, particularly Qatar, uh, which is playing a very vigorous diplomatic role, both through Al Jazeera, its media channel, and through uh, diplomatic channels and the Arab League. Uh, so there's a new dynamism in the Arab League. Uh, uh, the position vis-a-vis -vis Syria uh, is partly uh, built on the precedent of Libya and uh, the issue of protecting civilians and taking a position about that. It also definitely reflects regional tensions over Iran's influence in the Arab world. Syria is the long-standing ally of Iran. Uh, it also reflects uh, sectarian tensions between Sunni states and non-Sunni states, whether they're Shiite or Alawi dominated as in Syria. So there's a lot of politics also involved in what's going on in Syria. Uh, the Arab League, I think, has taken the correct position so far, regardless of what their motivation is. They've stood up for human rights in Syria. They've tried to uh, come to stop the killing and uh, uh, create a negotiated settlement. They're trying to send a delegation to protect civilians. And I think they've put the Arab League in place to call for further action, possibly from the UN Security Council and others if things get uh, even worse in Syria. So the Arab League has, uh, is once again sort of a, a very important player in the, in the Arab world. I think that's a good thing.
Syria, uh, you know, in the past and again today, is kind of a battleground of influence uh, in the Levant or in the Middle East. Uh, countries with a deep interest in Syria, most importantly, are Iran. Uh, Iran has had an alliance with Syria since 1980, since the Islamic Revolution in Iran. Uh, through Syria, Iran has gained influence not only in Syria, but also in Lebanon, where it has built up Hezbollah. And by its presence in Syria and Lebanon, was also able reach, to reach out to Hamas uh, in the Palestinian territories and to be on the border with Israel through Hezbollah and through Syria, to be a player in the Arab-Israeli conflict or the Arab-Israeli potentially peace process. Uh, so Iran has a huge stake in, uh, in Syria. The fall of the regime in Syria would be the biggest strategic blow to Iran since the Iran-Iraq war in the 80s, would probably mark the end of kind of a heyday of Iranian influence, which began uh, really with the U.S. removal of Iran's enemies, who were the Taliban and Saddam Hussein. The U.S. removed those two. This was a great boon to Iran's ability to project its power both in the Middle East and in Asia. Uh, a, uh, but a loss of Syria would be a great reversal. It would lose influence in Syria and Lebanon over Israel and over Palestine. Uh, Turkey has uh, a great interest in Syria, not as strategic or large as, uh, as Iran by any means, but Turkey had built very good relations with Syria, uh, partly as Turkey's way to extend its influence in the Arab world and also uh, as an economic uh, gateway to the Arab East an overland route to, to the Gulf countries and to the markets of Syria and Jordan and Lebanon. Uh, also for the potential uh, of overland gas and oil transport from Iraq and the Gulf areas to the, the eastern Mediterranean, which Turkey is very interested in. So Turkey has an interest there as well. Turkey is also interested in having influence uh, in the post-Arab Spring, Arab world. Uh, Turkey is already democratic, and Turkey is led by a party which has strong Islamic roots. Uh, that could be the case eventually in, in Egypt. It's already more or less the case in Tunisia. could be the case in a post-Assad Syria. So the ruling party, the AKP party in Turkey, uh, sees that through these transformations that are democratic in nature, it could also have influence with the sort of Islamic-leaning governments that come to power and that would be a boon for Turkish uh, political influence and for its economic interests. Saudi Arabia has a big interest as well because it's uh, continuously trying to counterbalance Iranian influence. Uh, and the Gulf countries hence are also very concerned and interested in what ends up happening in Syria. They are now backing effectively the opposition uh, and uh, rather hostile to the regime. F a change of regime in Syria would be certainly welcomed by most of the Gulf countries. The conflict in Syria would have two levels of impact. Uh, I mean, one level of impact is if the regime changes, uh, and if the new regime has different foreign relations than the current one, uh, if the new regime drops its deep alliance with Iran in favor of a closer relations with Turkey and Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries and Europe and so on, perhaps while maintaining good relations with Iran, still that would be a, a sea change in Middle Eastern politics. It would end uh, 30 years of Syrian-Iranian alliance. Uh, that would uh, uh, l dramatically reduce Iranian influence in, in the Middle East over Syria, Lebanon, Palestine and Israel. Um, also, a change in regime in Syria would directly impact Hezbollah's strategic environment. Hezbollah has built itself up as a major strategic force uh, with a strategic cover and a strategic bridge provided by Syria. Uh, if that bridge is removed, uh, uh, Hezbollah would be in a much more vulnerable, much more difficult strategic situation. Effectively, it might not be able to resupply at the levels it could resupply previously if it were in a war, if it attacked or were attacked. Uh, now that situation might, uh, might ignite a war between Israel and Hezbollah at some later date, uh, or it might open the possibility for uh, renewed peace talks between Syria and Israel. A new regime in, in, in Damascus would certainly want to get the Golan Heights back through negotiation and might want to at the same time reduce Hezbollah's influence. Uh, 
So one could imagine a peace track which would deal with Hezbollah, or one could fear the risk of war uh, on that track as well. Um, it would uh, also, a change in regime in Syria would uh, further uh, reduce Hamas's links through Syria with Iran and put Hamas, which has already moved closer to Egypt and zone, further on that, on that track. And it would cause Iran to retrench, possibly to double down on Iraq. So what we could be looking at, you know, with a possible change of regime in Syria and a U.S. withdrawal from Iraq is sort of a, a switch or a power shift in the Middle East, with Syria possibly drifting eventually closer to the Gulf and Turkey, and Iran, uh, you know, exploiting the American withdrawal by further trying to build influence inside Iraq. Otherwise, a, a extended transition and a violent transition inside Syria would have sectarian conflict risks. Uh, fighting between Sunni and Alawi groups uh, might uh, trigger fighting between Sunni and Shiite groups in Lebanon or make things worse in Iraq. Uh, 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 attacks on the Christian community in, in Syria, which, which many in Syria fear uh, in a period of lawlessness, uh, might have a huge impact on the Christian community there, as the Christian community in Iraq was also impacted by lawlessness in Iraq. Uh, that could have impacts on the Christians of Syria. It could have impacts on Christians in, in other parts, Lebanon and elsewhere. Uh, so certainly, uh, you know, change in Syria is has a lot of opportunity. Syria certainly deserves, like other Arab countries, to finally get to a well-governed, democratic, well-ordered society. But certainly, this is a very tough regime uh, and a very powerful one, and the transition might be quite difficult.